Good afternoon. I'm Tom Putnam, director of the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum. And on behalf of Tom McNaught, executive director of the Kennedy Library Foundation, and all of my library and foundation colleagues, I thank you all for coming and our C-SPAN viewers for tuning in. I also acknowledge the generous underwriters of the Kennedy Library Forum's lead sponsor, Bank of America, Raytheon, Boston Capital, the Lowell Institute, the Boston Foundation, and our media partners, the Boston Globe and WBUR. Let me state from the outset as clearly as I can that few individuals did more to help John F. Kennedy get elected than his running mate, Lyndon Johnson, who had an immeasurable impact on JFK's victory in the 1960 election. Yet it must also be noted that before that inspired partnership, the two men were rivals. This comes as no surprise, as throughout their lives, both were fiercely competitive. My favorite anecdote about LBJ, perhaps apocryphal, is the story that after his presidential library opened, the former president wanted to ensure that its visitation numbers topped those of all the other presidential libraries. So he came up with a novel strategy. As you may know, the library is on the campus of the University of Texas and located right next to the football stadium. <laughs> Have them announce at halftime, LBJ allegedly urged, that there are plenty of bathrooms with no lines at my library. <laughs> Knowing that each restroom visitor could then be included in the library's overall visitation statistics. And don't think when those numbers are periodically released today that the presidential library directors don't immediately look to see how we compare with our peers. The only time the Kennedy-Johnson rivalry led to a face-to-face -face exchange was when LBJ invited JFK to a debate before the Texas caucus at the beginning of the 1960 convention, which LBJ hoped would be brokered in order to provide an opportunity for him to be nominated. His critique of JFK that he was too young referring to Kennedy as a lightweight who needed a little gray in his hair. Quote, the forces of evil will have no mercy for innocence, he proclaimed, no gallantry for inexperience. And in their impromptu debate, without mentioning JFK by name, LBJ contrasted the absenteeism of some senators with his own dedicated leadership in the United States Senate. I assume, JFK replied when it was his turn to speak, that Senator Johnson was talking about some other candidate, not me. I want to commend him for a wonderful record in answering quorum calls. I was not present on all those occasions. I was not majority leader. So I come here today full of admiration for Senator Johnson, full of affection for him, and strongly in support of him as majority leader. <laughs> Having deftly defeated LBJ's last minute challenge, JFK went on to win the nomination on the first ballot and immediately reached out to Lyndon Johnson to serve as his running mate a decision that would change the course of history, a portion of which is now retold in compelling fashion by my friend and colleague Mark Updegrove in his new book, Indomitable Will, LBJ and the Presidency. As one reviewer has written, Mark Updegrove offers not another great man biography, but rather an innovative, illuminating, extraordinary portrait of a fascinating, contradictory, contradictory and enduringly important president. This new volume artfully combines LBJ in his own words, others' observations on what he did and how he did it, and transcripts of key LBJ phone conversations, leading to a balanced, full disclosure depiction of our 36th president. Our moderator this evening is John Avalon, senior columnist for Newsweek and The Daily Beast, as well as a CNN commentator. He's the author of Independent Nation, How Centrists Can Change American Politics, and editor of Deadline Artists, America's Greatest Newspaper Columns. A forum speechwriter for New York City Mayor Rudy Giuliani, after the attacks of September 11th, he and his team were responsible for writing the eulogies of the city's fallen policemen and firefighters, and an essay he wrote on the attacks won acclaim as the single best piece written in the wake of the tragedy. One commentator has written that Mr. Avalon talks about politics the way ESPN anchors wrap up sports highlights. Captured perfectly by the title of one of his best selling books, Wingnuts How the Lunatic Fringe is Hijacking America. <laughs> Let me note that John is married to Margaret Hoover, who is President Hoover's great granddaughter, and who is here with us this evening. Lady Bird Johnson once granted an interview with two students who were researching a National History Day project in which they would write and perform a dramatic dialogue between Lyndon Johnson and Martin Luther King. They told her the stage would be simple, with the two students seated side by side with a bit of dry ice to make it look like heaven. 
Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, Lady Bird said. What makes you think Lyndon made it up there? <laughs> Wherever Lyndon Johnson's soul may rest, I trust he is looking with favor upon these proceedings. Proud that we've gathered to discuss his presidency, though chagrined that given the choice between our two libraries, C-SPAN has chosen Boston over Austin to record a session on this new groundbreaking book, which means the Kennedy Library gets to count those millions of viewers as part of our outreach statistics. <laughs> But with all sincerity, Mark, I nod my head, gray-haired though it may be, with respect and admiration for you, for this new biography, for the Johnson Presidential Library, and for the man it so masterfully honors. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the Kennedy Library, Mark Updegrove and John Apple. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Well. I guess the competition between political leaders never really ends. Or, uh, but Mark, I mean, this is an extraordinary uh, book you've done, Indomitable Will. It, it is a portrait of a man by those who knew him, but it doesn't fall into that trap of, of so many oral histories because it's thematic and you really get a sense of what Johnson's leadership style was. And, and it is such a contrasting leadership style with many other presidents. And because we're here at the JFK Library, um, the book begins with that awful moment of his ascension to the presidency, where Lady Bird Johnson says so memorably, people looked at the living and wished for the dead. That burden upon which he assumed the presidency and the contrast between those two styles. Talk a little bit about that relationship and how they were received. Uh, thanks, John. I, and I will answer the question, but I do want to respond to my, my <laughs> dear friend and my colleague, uh, Tom Putnam, by saying, A, the story is true. And B, I think we had more visitors last year than the JFK Library, but I'm not. <laughs> um, the, the two were completely different. John F. Kennedy and Lyndon Baines Johnson were, were fundamentally different human beings. And, uh, and I think that, that LBJ was, was keenly aware that he was succeeding somebody who was so graceful and who was an al almost set an, an impossible standard by which to be measured, partly because of his martyrdom. But, but Liz Carpenter, who worked for Mrs. Johnson, worked for both of the Johnsons, and was kind of the, the Dorothy Parker of the political set uh, <laughs> in the 1960s, uh, I think encapsulated the, the differences between the two men very eloquently. Uh, eloquently. She said that, I think that presidents can be summed up in one word, Kennedy inspired, which Johnson was incapable of doing, and Johnson delivered. And I think that's absolutely true. If, if uh, uh, John F. Kennedy, in my view, begs to be judged by his words, he's so inspiring, he's so eloquent, he's so visionary. Ask not what your country could do for you. Ich bin ein Berliner. Uh, we choose the moon. And Johnson begs to be judged by his deeds, what he accomplished, what he did. He wasn't telegenic. He wasn't particularly graceful as a media personality. But he delivered. He knew how to get things done. And if you look at his legislative record, this is a formidable president, and probably the most important president legislatively in my lifetime. And look at the full sweep of the great society and how it resonates today. It is absolutely remarkable. One of the things, I do think that, that the way Johnson is being remembered going forward that legislative accomplishment is such a clear contrast with not just Kennedy, but so many other presidents. Someone who really knew Washington. Uh, someone who knew how to get things done. Uh, and yet someone who even in our sort of demythologized age uh, was such a, a, a vivid figure. And you quote peer, person after person who worked for him, um, talking about the complexity of man, the, the way that he embodied all these contradictions that were vivid and in your face, that he could be profane and patriotic and, and inspiring and then take you off balance and intimidating. Um, I, I wonder if, if the choice to do this oral biography, is that in part a way to capture the different facets of this complex personality? You know, I think that the, the, the challenge that a biographer has in capturing Lyndon Johnson is he is so enormously complex. And the way that I, I ensured that this was even-handed and balanced, which I think a lot of 
the biographies about Lyndon Johnson or not, is to get myriad impressions, verbatim, and to ensure that those impressions are, are mixed. Because very often, people have these in, intrinsically contradictory views of, of LBJ and, and what he meant and, and how he conducted himself. And part of the reason is because he treated everybody differently. He knew what your hot button was, and your hot button was different than the person next to you. That's how he got things done so effectively. That's how he was such a persuasive and effective legislator, because he understood that. He understood human psychology so brilliantly. Yeah. So he would treat you differently than he would treat Tom or, or Margaret or whomever. And so your impression is valid, but might completely contradict theirs. Let's go a little more into that, because there's a famous Johnson treatment where he flatters and he cajoles and he intimidates to get legislators to do what he wants. But beneath that is, uh, you just said psychology. I was uh, struck by one, one quote here from Hubert Humphrey, his, his vice president, who said, Johnson was a psychiatrist. Unbelievable man in terms of si sizing people up, what they would do, how they'd stand up under pre pressure, what their temperament was. This was his genius. And then talked about how he would analyze every single member. How much of it really was this kind of animal understanding of people's weaknesses and how to exploit them? And how much was actually a really sophisticated barometer of, of what people wanted uh, as well as what they, they didn't want? I think it was probably a combination of both. Um, Jack Valenti talked about him uh, being fascinating. He sort of, he looked at him like he would a panther. <laughs> you know? yeah. It's a beautiful animal, but he was ready to pounce. And, and Johnson, you know, Johnson had that animalistic element to him, but he was also incredibly smart. And because he sometimes comes across as being crude, well, I don't think we give him credit for this very incisive intellect. He was incredibly smart. He got things, you know, he got things very quickly. He had a very facile mind. And so I think it's a combination of both, John. And, and I, I mean, that's so key to, I think, his, his effectiveness. I mean, that, that unparalleled, literally unparalleled legislative record that he was able to achieve. Yeah. Bringing those skills as master of the Senate majority, you know, as Senate majority leader to the presidency that we may not see again. Yeah. You know, the real questions about whether a man like Johnson in our media saturated age could, could, could become president. And then his very tenuous relationship between who he was in private so effectively lobbying legislators. And, and then he kind of stiffened up in front of the cameras a bit. And it's that image gap you talk about. And one thing beneath that, uh, one, of, one of the people in the books talks about how he seemed to be trying to impress the, the, Harvard, the Harvard academic crowd with his public persona when he stiffened up. Um, one of the fascinating things you see with Johnson, and, and maybe is shared with Nixon in terms of their feelings about Jack Kennedy, is that real resentment for Northeast elites that, that you know, we came up the hard way. Uh, and, 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 and a real distrust and, and anger and resentment at, at these perceived elites. Talk about how that motivated him and was a real contrast between him and Jack Kennedy. Yeah, I think he had, he had a deep resentment for the Harvards, he would call them, or the, you know, the Northeastern establishment. And, and the Kennedys, in so many ways, epitomize that. And, uh, but he would say, you know, he would call meetings together in his office, and he'd say, it's very interesting how, you know, we, I look at this table, and we have three people from Yale, and we have two people from Harvard, and we have one person from Dartmouth, and the President of the United States from Southeastern, South, Southwestern Texas University, Teachers College, you know. <laughs> it's an it's a, it's amazing thing. And, he, and I, one could see him, I think he, he, he did resent them in, in a certain respect, but one could almost see him saying, I'll show these Ivy League boys what this country boy can do. And in, his, in some way, he wielded his countrified Texan personality, almost self-righteously, to kind of show these, these, these folks up. I think, it, you, you, but, but the interesting contradiction, and again, this is a man who is so complex and so rife with contradiction, is that he, um, he almost modeled a presidential personality, which he only assumed in front of the cameras. And it was completely contrived. It had nothing to do with Johnson. It was, it was totally inauthentic. And as my friend Hugh Side, he was a longtime columnist for Time magazine and, and knew Johnson, covered Johnson, uh, said it was a nervous bow to the Harvard faculty. You know, That's quote. Because it, it just wasn't quite Johnson. And, and the way that Johnson was so effective is when he was Johnson. 
You know, he just let himself be himself. That's how he got things done so effectively. That, that, that's probably a good, uh, a good opportunity to segue into a, a semi-softball, which is your favorite Johnson story, the one that kind of archetypally communicates that, that earthiness and, and persuasiveness. There's a, there's a, uh, there's a conversation in the, uh, in, the, in the book that I recount, and it would be almost impossible to, 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 to relate it with, and do it justice. You almost you have to hear it or read it. And it's Johnson calling the scion uh, of the founder and the president of the Hagar Slacks Company. And he's ordering slacks, custom-made slacks. And it shows his penchant for micromanagement and his tendency toward crudity in his worst moments. Because he gives very specific anatomical detail <laughs> for how he wants these pants to fit. And you can't make this stuff up. If you saw this on Saturday Night Live, you'd say, oh, that's far-fetched. No, come on, that's ridiculous. But it's true. It really happened. And, uh, and I will say, of the 643 hours of taped telephone conversations, which, featured, which are featured yeah. prominently in the book, there's not one that even comes close to this level of crudity. But those who know Johnson don't deny it. Would, it, it it's part of his personality. It's, his personality is so broad and so deep that he was certainly capable of, of, of that. And, uh, but you got to hear it. You it, hear it. It's, it's, it's pretty remarkable even in transcript, let me tell you. <laughs> um, but but it, does, it does communicate a couple of things. I mean, one, uh, he, he, they talk about how he, he would fixate so intensely on achieving a certain goal, in this case, getting a pair of pants that fit just right. right. And, and he, he, nothing would stop him from achieving that particular goal. And, and he, at the same time, he'd say, you know, Flattery, he flatters him, and then he'd criticize him. And, and, and this sort of fascinating, you know, yo-yo uh, that, that, you, that you see, and he, he even, says, even in that. At one point, John, he says, uh, he says now, now, you got to you, you get the pants here right away. You know, I, I need them for summer wear down at the ranch. Nothing's more important. <laughs> Nothing more important than six pairs of customized pants. And, uh, but but they're, they're, at, at the very end of the conversation, uh, Joe Hager, who is completely taken by surprise that the President of the United States is calling him to order pants, said, where should I send them? And he says, White House. <laughs> it's, a, it's wonderful. It's, a, it's just a wonderful conversation. Well, it's a good motivational tool. There's nothing more important than this pair of pants. But I, if I can relate yeah. one more story. Sure, it's, a, it's, a, it's a light story. You know, people uh, will talk about how difficult it was to work for Johnson. We might talk about that later. Mm -hmm. but. Uh, and he was. He was. He was really a difficult taskmaster. Uh, but nobody. He expected nobody to work harder than he worked. But there's a wonderful story uh, from a guy named Devere Pearson, who was a White House counsel in the LBJ White House. And he talks about the the days of the transition from from LBJ to Nixon. And and Johnson wanted to make sure that everybody on his staff was taken care of, that they had a place to go after working for, at the White House for him. It was part of being loyal, and he held that up as the most important thing in politics, loyalty. He said that time and time again. So Devere Pearson signs out of the White House, which you more or less had to do. And the president got this log every day to determine who was in the White House and who wasn't there. And again, given his penchant for micromanagement, he always knew who was there and who wasn't. And Devere Pearson goes out to Los Angeles to interview for a white shoe from a very, you know, good, top-notch law firm in Los Angeles. And he's meeting with the partners in this beautiful conference room, and a, a secretary comes in very flustered and says, Mr. Pearson, the President of the United States is on the line for you. The President's calling. And the partner says to him, or the lead partner says to him, you know what, uh, you, you need to take this. We'll, we'll adjourn from the conference room, let you take the Take as long as you want. We'll come back when you tell us to. So he gets on the phone. He says, Mr. President, he says, yes. He says, he said, Mr. President, I don't know if you noticed, but, but I, I, I signed out of the White House. I'm not there today. He says, yes, I know. He says, well, what can I do for you, Mr. President? He says, oh, nothing. I just thought the call would help. <laughs> so that contradicts sort of the ruthless... Johnson that you hear of in lore. Everybody who worked for him has uh, a story of his great generosity. 
and, and that, that love of loyalty, which he said was the, the preeminent political virtue. When, when you're looking and going through compiling this on the, the, the transcripts, these are, these are the presidential tapes that didn't get someone impeached, right? Um, they, they really are, as a friend of mine once told me, kind of seminars in political power, political leadership. What are some of the common traits, and we'll talk about one in particular, that you see when you, you get this sense of Johnson, you know, a, as it was in real time, trying to convince someone to go his way? You know, it, 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 um, I think it's, it's just an indomitable will, which led to the title of this, of this book. He just, he wanted things. And, and by God, when he wanted them, he found a way to get them done. So you hear the intensity with which he conducts the business of his presidency. And it's interesting because while the, the, uh, the tapes of Richard Nixon uh, are, you know, are a blemish on the Nixon record, they sort of condemn Richard Nixon by the light of history, the tapes, the telephone tapes of Lyndon Johnson vindicate him. Uh, we, we didn't know these existed. That it was not uh, revealed that they actually existed until after Lyndon Johnson died when his assistant let the then director of the LBJ Library, Harry Middleton, know that they were in a vault somewhere. And uh, so when, when the Johnsons decide, when, when Mrs. Johnson consented to opening them in the 1990s, they had no idea what was on these tapes. Absolutely no idea. And as you listen to them, I think they, they shed very positive light on the, on the Johnson legacy. When you look at the Johnson legacy, I think at the end of his administration, people were preoccupied with Vietnam. It was the big fact of our foreign policy and in many ways our domestic policy. But clearly I think civil rights is, is as Vietnam recedes in the memory, the legacy of civil rights is ever clearer, ever more present in our daily lives and, and I think will lead to his uh, not only reassessment but vindication as a president in many respects. There's one conversation that's in the book where he's given the Johnson treatment in person to uh, George Wallace, Alabama governor. And, and it's a remarkable interpersonal persuasion at a pivotal moment in history. I don't know if you'd care to maybe read it to the, the uh, audience. It's on the left-hand side there. I'd happily do this. Um, start here. Sure. He said, well, let me set the stage. Uh, Wallace resisted the notion of sending federal troops into Alabama when, when, this, when the, the voting rights uh, issue was at play. And, and Alabama was almost at a, at a boiling point. And so um, Wallace is called to the White House. And like JFK, uh, LBJ had a rocking chair in his Oval Office. And he was six feet three inches tall. And he would frequently have somebody where, where John is sitting on a, on a couch that was far lower than the rocking chair. <laughs> and Johnson would rock the chair up and literally lean over them <laughs> and look down at them. And now bear in mind, uh, as I mentioned, LBJ is six feet three inches tall. And George Wallace is five feet four inches tall. And so it's like a snake over a mongoose. <laughs> it just, it, it, it's ridiculous. But I'll read, I'll read the, the passage. Um, he said, so, so he's asking George to send federal troops in, and Wallace says, I don't have the power to do this. He says, oh, yes, Mr. President, there's no point about that. Johnson says, then why don't you let them vote? Wallace says, well, you know, now I don't have the power. That belongs to the country registrars in the state of Alabama. And Wallace insists that no, he didn't have the legal authority. Johnson says, well, George, why don't you persuade them? He says, well, I don't think I can do that. He said, now, don't shit me about your persuasive powers, George. You know, I sat down this morning when I got up, all three of the TV sets, I'm going to just quote this. Sure. Yeah. All three of the TV sets in my Oval Office were on, and you were talking to the, to the press, George, and, and you were hammering me, George. I heard you. You were hammering me. I said, no, no, Mr. President. I said, no, 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 no. You were hammering, and you were good. He said, you were so good, I almost believed it myself. <laughs> but then at the very end of the conversation, he says, now, now, George, you've worked your life in, in politics. 
Think about, let's not think about 1965. Let's think about 1985, George. Neither of us will be around. We'll be dead. Now, what do you want people saying about you in your state of Alabama? Do you want people to say, George Wallace, he built? Or do you want people to say, George Wallace, he hated? He was good. Johnson was that good. And sure enough, uh, George Wallace relented. We got federal troops, and we eventually got the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which is the most important legislation in civil rights. Without the voting rights of 1965, you don't have Barack Hussein Obama in the White House in 2012. Definitely not. Um, let's talk about Johnson's commitment to civil rights, because it, it confused a lot of people. Here he was, an archetypal Southern Democrat. One quote I saw him, uh, he was referring to the stereotypes about himself before he became president. He said, oh, this old Confederate, why? People are asking, why am I advancing civil rights? He had to rebuke and challenge many of his mentors, Senator Russell in particular. Um, but he formed this cross-aisle coalition to get civil rights done. Talk about the, the roots of his commitment to civil rights. Did it have to do with his, uh, the fact he grew up in poverty? Uh, there's one anecdote about uh, one of his personal aides recounting the trouble uh, he had driving to, through the South. And then the legislative skills it took to pass this with bipartisan support. Yeah, I think that the, the Johnson psychology is, it, he felt things deeply, deeply. Whether it be the sting of the judgment of the Eastern establishment or, or people living in poverty. And he called, he declared famously a war on, on poverty uh, in his State of the Union speech in 1964. And, you know, he says, this administration herewith declares a war on poverty. And you can just see in his eyes, he hates the very notion of poverty. I think there's a very formative experience that he talked about in, a very, in the most important speech of his political life, 1965, when he's talking about the importance of civil rights. And the experience was between his junior and senior year in college, he taught school at a, in a, the very small town of Catula, Texas, which was principally populated by uh, Mexican Americans who were largely forgotten. And these kids had, had a, just the image of these kids in poverty and the, the victims of big, bigotry and hatred were just seared in his conscience and his, his uh, consciousness. And he never forgot those kids. And when he got to the White House, he would say to his staff, don't forget about those kids in Couture. Don't forget about those Mexican-American school kids. His fight for civil rights, interestingly enough, was not just about African Americans. It was about the Hispanic kids that he knew. But moreover, it was an attack on poverty. He didn't want to see people poor and disenfranchised in this country. And he felt that deeply. If I can just talk about one, there are two stories that really show how the, the, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 came about. Uh, with Civil Rights Act of 1964, which ended the Jim Crow really legal apartheid in this country. And the first is with Richard Russell, and you mentioned it, John. And Richard Russell was a Democratic senator from Georgia who was a friend and mentor to LBJ. And he realizes in order to get the Civil Rights Act of 1964 passed, he has to run over Richard Russell. And he invites him to the Oval Office, and he had this very tense conversation. And, and Russell says, you know, I, I, you'll, you have the legislative muster to get the Civil Rights Act passed. I don't think John, Jack Kennedy had it, but, but you have it. But I'll warn you, if you do it, you'll lose the, the southern states to the Republican Party, and you may well lose the election of 1964. And Johnson, this great creature of power, hears this and quietly replies, if that's the price for this bill, I will gladly pay it. It's just tremendous political courage. And while I think we think of Johnson, we, we think about the means of Lyndon Johnson, all his powers of persuasion, how he hoarded power and, and craved it. But we don't think about the ends. 
how he expended the political capital that he garnered. And it was on things like that that fundamentally transformed this country. The other story relating to this is that in order to get the Civil Rights Act passed, he had to engender a relationship with the Republicans. He had to get over them over to his side. And there's a conversation I recount with the Senate minority leader, Everett Dirksen, in which he says, you know, I was just at, he, and, and Dirksen's from Illinois, and he says, you know, I was just at your, your state fair in Illinois, and I went to an exhibit, and it's the land of Lincoln, and you're worthy of the land of Lincoln, and I'm to, I'll make sure that if you pass this bill, you get proper credit. And sure enough, the first pen he gives out after signing the Civil Rights Act of 1964 is not to Martin Luther King, it's to Everett Dirksen. Uh, so he took that very seriously. And I think there's a certain civility with the way that, uh, that, that, that Washington uh, behaved in that time that we just, we don't see in, in, our, in our current age. Well, to that end, you know, his, one of the Senate aides, Bobby Baker, there's a quote in here, which he said was one of Johnson's favorites. He said, any idiot can kick a bar down, but it takes a pretty good carpenter to build one. Uh, and, and there's that sense of, you know, it's not about destroying, it's building. It's about actually getting the ball down the field, working with Dirksen to form a coalition. Uh, what do you think, as, as the master of the Senate that he was, Johnson would think about what the Senate has become and the kind of values that he tried to instill to get legislation accomplished but also keep a sense of national purpose behind policy? Yeah, there was his favorite quote, uh, biblical quote, was from Isaiah. Uh, come let us reason together. And I'm confident that if he saw Washington today, uh, he would think that there was uh, a dearth of reason uh, and a dearth of togetherness. There just isn't the unity. And I think there are, there are a lot of reasons for that. I think one is that uh, lawmakers simply don't know each other any longer. They don't live with one another. Their kids don't play on the same baseball team or go to the same ballet class. Their wives aren't playing bridge together as they did in, in that day. I think he would lament the, the lack of civility that we see in Washington today. I think that would be his greatest disappointment. In, in, in the intervening past several decades, and we're going to get to Vietnam in a second, which no question cast a huge shadow over his legacy, I think, in the 70s and 80s, uh, the sheer amount of legislative accomplishment in 1965 in particular, the way he was actually, you could see him acting as both chief executive and Senate majority leader. You know, that, that unique set of experiences that very rarely do we have in one man. That, that enormous amount of legislation that passed that really creates the America we know. Talk about that, that full court press, because he did approach it that way. After one win, there was not time to rest. It was on to the next thing. And then maybe why it, it, it provoked a backlash or didn't get at least the credit that it deserved in the eyes of the immediate aftermath of history. Yeah, I think that, that he, he felt that political capital was tantamount to green stamps. Do you all remember green stamps? So you put, you know, you, you collected these stamps and you put them in a book and if you didn't redeem them, well, you didn't get anything for those green stamps. So he wanted to spend them. He wanted to collect his green stamps to continue the analogy and he wanted to buy something uh, meaningful with it. And that's what he did with 1965. He knew that he, he was at the peak of his political powers. In, and he wanted to spend that in the right way. And 1965, I would venture to say, may be the most important year legislatively of the 20th century. I don't think that maybe 1933 compares when LBJ was ushering in his New Deal. But if you look, and, and actually into my office, I have in a shadow box, you've seen this, yeah. all of the, the pens that LBJ used to sign legislation throughout the course of that one year. And in one box, you have pens that sign the Voting Rights Act of 1965, the Immigration Act of 1965, the most sweeping immigration reform in the history of America. You have the pen that creates the National Endowment for the Humanities and the National Endowment for the Arts. You have clean air. You have uh, elementary and secondary education and higher education, which is federal aid to education for the first time, which you know, is, is, results in soaring graduation rates from high school and college and on and on and on. It is astounding what this man did in one year. And he knew it wouldn't last, and it was, he was prescient. It didn't last. So 
what created that political capital was the landslide win of 1964. Um, we are in a presidential re-elect year two. I don't think anyone thinks that uh, the current president could hope for a landslide of those uh, proportions. But talk a little bit about the way Johnson approached that re-elect effort against Barry Goldwater. Goldwater defeats Nelson Rockefeller. The map begins to shift. As, as Johnson and, and Moyers have said, you know, the South begins to vote Republican for the first time in that year. But Johnson really, I think, I think won 45 states, maybe 44. Talk about Johnson's approach to getting that landslide win. Well, he, he, you know, it was a no-holds-barred campaign without question. Uh, I think that the interesting thing is, is uh, not so much Johnson in 64, it's Goldwater. And Goldwater realizes he doesn't have a chance of winning. He really does realize that from the beginning. And you hear that in, in yeah. his oral history in the book. He knows that with the, the martyrdom of, of, of John F. Kennedy and the ascension to, uh, to the presidency from Lyndon Johnson and the admirable job that Johnson does in his first year that the, the, the country doesn't have an appetite for change. This is not his moment. And I must say he's quite graceful about it. He is. And the two remain, uh, remain friendly throughout the course and they even have a, a meeting at the uh, Oval Office in which they just say they will not make race an issue in the campaign, knowing that uh, it could be used by either side to divide the country and, 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 and gain, uh, you know, advantage. That's in, a in remarkable election. moment. It is. You know, where, where these two, given that the, the amount of history being made and the tensions that these two nominees come together and say, we will not, you know, we will not try to manipulate race for political purposes when that's been so much a story of American politics up to that point. He also had one of the worst taglines, in your heart you know he's right which is akin to saying, take this medicine because it's good for you. Might not taste good, but it's good for you. Yeah, and then, and then I think one of Johnson's supporters switched that around and said, in your, in your guts, you know he's nuts. Right. That didn't help. <laughs> but, but Goldwater does come across just very gracious, and, 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 and there is a sense of deep disagreement, but civil disagreement, that, that I think does speak to that bygone era. Yeah. Um, and, and then Johnson, in his one presidential run, really gets this unbelievable landslide. One detail jumped out at me, uh, and then we'll, we'll go to Vietnam. He left office with the only surplus uh, until Bill Clinton. Yeah. That is so the opposite of what you think about the great society. Yeah, he, 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 you're right. He was, was the last president before Bill Clinton in 1998, I believe, yeah. to, to throw money back. I think it was $3.2 billion that he put back into the federal coffers. Uh, now, I will say, John, that, you know, there was some political pressure there, that the, the appetite for legislation among uh, you know, the, the, the Republicans uh, in the House and Senate had waned significantly by that time, uh, and to a certain degree, it was dictated by the Republicans. But, but Johnson was very fiscally prudent. If you look at how much was accomplished during the course of the Johnson years, legislative, and how many programs went into effect, they weren't particularly expensive by today's standards. Yeah, at least at first. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> um, let's, uh, let's talk Vietnam, foreign policy. Um, one of the things that, that struck me in, in reading the book is how much Johnson had been influenced by, as we all are, by the examples in his own lifetime of the weakness at Munich when he's a young congressman. Why he perceived and, and was perceived as weakness of FDR in the face of Stalin in Yalta and the aftermath that led to the Cold War, even criticizes Ike for not stopping Castro from taking power. And that that life experiences, this, this determination that strength in world leaders matters, leads him into Vietnam uh, at, down a road that he knows, he believes must be done, and he believes can be done quickly before the 68 election. Yeah. Um, talk about that, that approach to world affairs that maybe didn't, doesn't resonate across the generations as clearly, that conviction about the importance of resoluteness, sure. indomitable will. We think of, uh, when we think of the domino theory, we think of the Cold War. But in fact, the domino theory had played out in World War II. When Neville Chamberlain went to Munich and struck an agreement, uh, you know, appeased Adolf Hitler in 1939, and came back to the UK to infamously proclaim peace in our time. Well, we didn't have peace at all. What we got was World War II. And so what Johnson says, that there's a chapter by this name, he says, there will be no men with umbrellas. And is of course referring to the hapless Chamberlain. 
he is not going to relent to the communists. He truly believed that he had to stave off the communist aggression in Vietnam. Because if he didn't, then the other nations of Southeast Asia, Asia would fall. And moreover, it would embolden the, 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 the Chinese and the Soviets to grab land elsewhere in the world. So he thought he was preventing World War II and believed that to his dying day, that you had to take a stand in Vietnam. That, uh, there's an interesting conversation, though, John, uh, two conversations that I, I relate. Both happened to be on the same day. One is with Richard Russell, again, his friend and mentor, Democratic uh, senator from Georgia, and another is with McGeorge Bundy. And in the latter conversation, and, he, and you can hear in these conversations his profound ambivalence over what's going on in Vietnam and whether he should escalate the war or not. And there's one quote that's really haunting from Johnson. He says, what the hell is Vietnam to me? I can't win it and I can't get out. And it's so prescient. But what, what I didn't appreciate until I really delved into this book is how much he anguished over trying to find a peaceful resolution to the war, which is ultimately one of the reasons that he didn't run for re-election again in 1968. He desperately wanted to spend his final months trying to find a peaceful and honorable way out of Vietnam, where, by the way, both of his sons-in-law were serving at that point in time. And that famous picture where he's anguished listening to the tape recorder is he's listening to one of his sons-in-law from the front lines. Yeah, it's interesting. It's personal. Exactly. And you all may know the, the, the photo that John is referring to. He is bent over in pure anguish on the, conference, on the, uh, the cabinet room table listening to his son Chuck Robb in Vietnam, relating his experience in Vietnam. And it's interesting, we, we think of the, the uh, in, in terms of iconography, the, the Johnson uh, presidency is bookended in tragedy. We think, of course, of the famous photograph of him being sworn in on Air Force One in the wake of the assassination. That's one tragedy. And at the end of his term, with his face down on that cabinet room table, dealing with the, the anguish of Vietnam. And there's that sense that, that the, the country is slipping away from him so quickly. Um, that, that Johnson's genius at human psychology is one-on-one. -on -one. But he increasingly, in that end of his term, had trouble understanding the mass psychology of what was going on, in particular with the protest movement. And the agony, I think uh, his press secretary describes it, Johnson at the end being in a, in a state of unreality. There was that White House bubble and not being able to comprehend what was going on with the protests. You know, it's interesting because I don't think he feared, one of the things I relate in there is, and Linda, Linda Johnson Robb relates this, he didn't fear the protesters. He didn't fear the doves as much as he feared the hawks. He really worried about the other side, the conservatives who said that he wasn't fighting the war hard enough. It was a limited war. He, 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 it couldn't be anything but a limited war because he didn't want the Chinese and, or the Russians to enter into it in a way that would uh, uh, create the threat of a hot war. That's the bottom line. There was a very delicate balance that he had to tread. And he thought about that every single day that that, that war was waged. And when he gets that memo from Under Secretary Ball saying that, you know, it's the one dissenting voice. Up to that point, you know, the wise men had all been in agreement. And, and then there's this one dissenting voice with a 75 page memo. Yeah. And, then, and then he's just anguished as that slowly he realizes that maybe the, the, the dissenting voice is the correct one. You know, there's, there's one chapter that I devote to a memo that very few people know about. Um, it, it's, at the, it's, it's open to the public, and it's at the LBJ Library, but it's, it's a memo from the CIA in which they talk about how, it, what would happen if you pulled troops out of Vietnam? What would be the effect on America and the world? And they essentially conclude that it can be done. And, the, and it's, it's the paradox of Lyndon Johnson that he didn't do anything with that memo. I don't, I don't know what his reaction to that memo was. It's lost to history. But I think the, the real fear he had that it would have this, was it, that it would have this tremendous this demoralizing effect over the American populace, and that we would lose our confidence and we would lose ground. There's one other incident you recount in the book that wasn't appreciated at the time, 
which is in those waning days of the administration, uh, where he's trying to get a peace deal done. And we find out it was actually actively being undercut by, by one liaison who was in communication with the Nixon campaign. Talk a little bit about that incident, because it's, it, it's fascinating, and I, I haven't heard much about it. Madame Chenault uh, was the wife of the, uh, the man who commanded the, the Flying Tigers in World War II. And she essentially acted as a conduit between the Nixon campaign uh, and the South Vietnamese. And she convinces the South Vietnamese that they should wait, they should hold off on striking a deal, a peace deal, with the Johnson administration because they would get a better deal with the Nixon administration. And Johnson finds out about this in the waning days of the 1968 campaign when his vice president, Hubert Humphrey, is out on, in the hustings trying to, to, to win the presidency. And Johnson doesn't do anything about it, but he, he tells, he just worries about what this revelation would do to America and the world at this very sensitive time. And so he goes to Hubert Humphrey, and he tells Humphrey about this. And Humphrey decides that it would be unpatriotic to reveal this in the last days of the campaign. It would too, be too upsetting. It would be uh, too destructive a thing to do. It's very courageous on Humphrey's part, but you wonder what would have happened in history had this uh, revelation been disclosed to the American public. One other revelation in the book, at least to me, regarding Humphrey was who Johnson wanted Humphrey to pick as a vice presidential nominee. Daniel Inouye, the, uh, the, the Hawaiian remarkable? senator. And he wanted to do it because it was one other barrier. I mean, this is Johnson who, uh, you know, passes the Civil Rights Acts of 1964 and 68 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. He appoints the first African-American cabinet member and the first African-American Supreme Court member. And he wants uh, uh, Hubert Humphrey to do something historic with his choice of a vice president. And picking an Asian American to round out the ticket is a way to do that. And, uh, and, uh, and this is a phone conversation, by the way. And, and Humphrey says, you know, old conservative Hubert, I just can't do it. <laughs> and, and Humphrey is anything but old and conservative. It's just, it's such a contradiction. Let's talk about, um, we're going to take questions from the audience in a bit, but, but I think it's, I don't think there's any way to round out the reality of the man without talking about his wife yeah. and, and Lady Bird Johnson. Um, the way that she is always steadfast in support of him, this mercurial personality, uh, and that she's always looking out for him. Uh, one of the things I was struck by um, in the beginning days of their courtship, besides the fact that her nickname was Lady Bird before she met Johnson, which I didn't adequately appreciate. I thought he was just trying to set up initial, you know, right. correlations. So when you're doing an intense courtship, the book that wouldn't occur to me to give out entirely is Nazism, an Assault on Civilization. <laughs> with this inscription, this is remarkable, to Bird, in the hopes that within these pages she may realize some little entertainment and find reiterated here, reiterated here some of the principles which she believes and which she has been taught to revere and respect. LBJ, September 1st, 1934. So this is a, this is a book about Nazism yeah. in 1934, you know, well before they've reared their ugly heads to the world, to, to a large extent. And it shows the worldview of this, uh, you know, ostensibly provincial couple from Texas. And they had a, a great view of the, of the world. But you know, you can't assess LBJ in and of himself. The Johnsons were a package deal. And I think most people saw them that, that way. And one of the things she talks about is as hard as it was to work for Lyndon Johnson, you had Lady Bird Johnson sort of as a buffer. And one of the things she said is, I always made sure I walked behind him and said, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I really do believe that they came as a package deal. There, there's one aide in there to the, uh, to the Johnsons who says, uh, you know, most uh, aides to presidents never have a meal with, with the president or, and first lady. It was hard to get out of a meal with Lyndon and Lady Bird Johnson. They really treated you as family. When you were at the ranch and Johnson spent 
a fifth of his presidency at the LBJ Ranch, where he could really relax uh, and re still conduct the business of his presidency. Everybody ate with the Johnsons. Everybody ate around a large table. So they were truly a package deal. And I think it, it's easier to understand LBJ when you understand Lady Bird. And I thought about this, and it took me about two hours to construct this sentence that I think sums up their relationship to a certain extent. And that is, uh, one wonders whether Johnson allowed his demons to graze knowing that she would ward them off by quietly summoning his better angels. I think she had that effect on him, her equanimity, her calm. She allowed him to pass the heat of the moment uh, and, and think more uh, deliberately about something, think of the long term, because this was a very mercurial guy. In that mercurialness, I mean, so many highs and lows in such a comparatively short period of time. Yeah. And, and we were talking earlier just about the bracketing of his presidency from time, cover of Time magazine when he's named Man of the Year after his landslide. And it's the statesman shot. And he's, he's in a business suit and there's the small sort of, you know, little hut he grew up in, you know, the rural farm. And it's this, he's got a visionary stare going forward of determination, indomitable will. And then three years later, he's depicted as King Lear. And it's this great tragedy going on in public um, that very much fits in some ways that manic depressive quality of his, his intensity and his achievement and his aspiration uh, and the way he left the White House. As a Johnson scholar, as someone who feels empathy for him, do you get the sense that he was able to see beyond the horizon of that tumultuous, painful last year and see vindication? Do you think that it was a case where imagery overtakes accomplishment, that that perception, the public perception of Johnson, didn't keep pace with his actual reparative accomplishment up until now? Yeah, it's a, it's a remark. You, you talk about the, 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 those two covers. I'll just uh, talk a little more about them. The first is 1965. He's named the man of the year of time. And, as John mentions, you see this picture of him, and it's this oil painting, and he looks strong and stolid. It would be the envy of any politician, man of the year. Oh, yeah. You know? And then that, that one three years later, it's a, it's a cartoon by David Levine of, of LBJ as King Lear, and he's being kicked by Bobby Kennedy and ignored by Everett Dirksen, and it's, just, it's, a, it's awful. And he's, he's turned into a cartoon to a certain degree. But I do believe that Johnson had the long view of history in mind. I really do. And if you look at his accomplishments, uh, I think you see that now. I don't think it was easy to see in 1973 when he died four years and two, year, two days after he left the White House when the, the long, cold shadow of Vietnam was still very much in evidence. But in 2012, I think that shadow is beginning to recede. And again, we're, we're beginning to see how the accomplishments of the Great Society continue to resound. I think he would be delighted that uh, he saw, in, in his, just in his tenure, poverty uh, being reduced from 20%, one out of every five Americans, to 12%. You know, to, and, and he saw that in his presidency. There were some things that he took from that. He saw African Americans being recognized as legal equals to Caucasians. He saw those things. Those things, I think, uh, sustained him in the darkest days of his presidency. I was struck on one final note. His parting gift to other world leaders was a photograph of Earth from space. And, and, and that did seem to sum up his, his longer view and the great pride he took about that mission that would ultimately reach the moon. There's one great triumph, uh, and, and that is that, you know, at the end of his presidency, and that's the Apollo 8 mission, which in some ways is as significant as the Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin uh, mission, uh, you know, Apollo 11 mission, which were there, landed on the moon. Apollo late, they, they did a circumlunar uh, trip to the moon. It was the first time a spacecraft had left Earth's atmosphere and gone to the moon. It was, it hovered 60 miles from the Earth's surface. And it happened to be on Christmas Eve when the astronauts, uh, Frank Borman, uh, Jim Lovell, and, um, and, and uh, Bill Anders, uh, are circuit, and, and, they, and they relate passages from Genesis on that night. It's incredibly inspiring. And someone 
wires them a telegram when they land saying, you saved 1968, which is probably the most tumultuous year in American history, save some of the years of the, of the, the, the Civil War. Uh, so that, that, that's his parting gift. I'll say one, one anecdote, if I can go back to sure. Lady Bird Johnson really quickly, John, before we take questions. And that is that uh, when LBJ got married, it was after a, uh, a six-week whirlwind courtship, which, in which he was plying the Johnson treatment at every turn. This was a very reluctant bride, and he sort of beat her into submission, or romanced her so into, to speak. Yeah, into right. submission. Uh, and they get married, and he has to hurriedly buy a ring, and he does so from Sears and Roebuck. It's, an, it's a $2.50 ring, which Lucy Johnson still wears to this day. And uh, well after he leaves the White House, several years later, he's on a vacation in Acapulco, I believe. And, and he's sort of berating her for a second. Why did it take you so long to, to, to trade in that ring and buy a new ring? I told you, shortly after we got married, go buy a beautiful ring. Why did it take you three years to do that? And she said, why, darling? I was just waiting to see if the marriage would last. <laughs> With that, we'll take some questions. We've got mics in either aisle, and uh, we really look forward to having a, a dialogue. D just come on up. You can line up behind the mics there, yeah. And there are ones on either side. Um, I would like to ask you to comment a little bit more on Bobby Kennedy and LBJ. Well, that was a, there's no way to sugarcoat it. That was a tough relationship. Uh, the two just were, were bitter rivals and enemies. And, and it's interesting, my uh, predecessor at the LBJ Library was a gentleman named, or predecessor's predecessor, was a gentleman named uh, Harry Middleton. Uh, and Harry talks about having a very candid conversation with LBJ, LBJ about that relationship. And, and Harry characterizes uh, LBJ as kind of like Will Rogers. He never met a man he didn't like. And I would revise that somewhat, although Harry knew the man and I didn't. I don't think, he never met a person he didn't want the approbation of. <laughs> he desperately wanted people's approval. And he, he would never get it from Bobby Kennedy. And he said, we could have spent a lifetime trying to be close, but there was just too much dividing us. And I'm not sure it, it, it could be summed up better than that. They were just very different people. And I think that uh, after John F. Kennedy was assassinated, it was very difficult for Bobby Kennedy to see this man in the role that his brother had filled so elegant, ele elegantly and so gracefully. Yeah, I mean, the Kennedys are so cool and Johnson is hot. Um, we'll flip over to the other side, we'll toggle between. Hi, I was wondering um, why Johnson accepted the vice presidential um, nomination when he, I think, had a lot more power in the Senate, and he couldn't foresee, obviously, that he would become president. And then um, the second part of that is, as vice president, was he kind of relegated to the side by the Kennedys? Um, you know, you talked about how um, Kennedy was inspirational, and Johnson was able to get things done, and I was wondering if there was ever a time when they could work as a team, and that whether if Kennedy had had um, a longer term in office, whether Johnson and he could have worked as a team to accomplish Kennedy's agenda. Well, let me ask, uh, answer your uh, uh, latter question first and your former question second. I think that there's a great example of their partnership with NASA. And, and it's a, it's a, it illustrates uh, the personalities and the strengths of the two men. Uh, it, LBJ was an early advocate of a robust American space program when it was, when our space program was feeble at best. And so he, one of the pens that uh, Eisenhower gives out when he signs the, uh, the, the law making, creating NASA is to, to Lyndon Johnson, was just such a proponent of it. But uh, JFK appoints him to head up the Space Commission when he becomes president. And he asks LBJ whether it's possible for, to send a man to the moon by the end of the decade. And LBJ looks into it and concludes, yes, that we, we probably can do that. And he does so by, and, and, and uh, LBJ helps that by, by really uh, uh, 
trying to help build NASA into this strong institution that it became. And so Johnson writes him this, this memo saying, yes, it's possible. And JFK goes out and he gives that very memorable speech. We choose the moon. You know? There's the visionary. And he captured the imagination of all Americans when he said that. I think it inspired us all. Let me ask you, answer your former question now about why he chose the vice presidency. Yes, he was the all-powerful Senate majority leader, but he knew that if, uh, if Kennedy became president, he would still be carrying water for Jack Kennedy. Moreover, though, and this is related in the book, um, Sam Rayburn comes to him and tells him, after telling him he shouldn't accept the vice presidency, tells him he should. And, and uh, LBJ asks very pointedly, well, why do you say today that I should accept the vice presidency when yesterday you, you, you said I shouldn't? And he says, because if you don't accept it, just as God made little green apples, Richard Nixon's going to become president of the United States. And that's something that, that, that Rayburn, who just despised Nixon, couldn't abide by. And, and I think that LBJ does it for the party. He does it for the country in large measure. Did he play any significant role, though, in the, I don't believe that Kennedy ever introduced any civil rights legislation. Is that right? But did he help? I know um, there was um, a lot of negotiation with Wallace during Kennedy's administration about letting the students into the university. And I'm wondering if Johnson played a role as a Southerner in any of that stuff. Well, I, uh, Johnson uses uh, JFK's martyrdom in part to get the Civil Rights Act of 1964 through. He right. says very pointedly to reluctant lawmakers, this is what uh, you know, our president would have wanted. This is what John F. Kennedy you, our, our fallen president would have wanted. You owe it to him and to this country. To get, he exploited that, that the death of John F. Kennedy to get it passed. I don't know if Kennedy couldn't have done it. I think it would have been very difficult for a lot of people to accept a Northeastern uh, Democrat getting civil rights passed. And I think just as it took Nixon to go to China, Nixon, the staunch anti-communist, to open China, it took, in some ways, Lyndon Johnson to give this country civil rights, this Southern Democrat, who had, to a large extent, resisted civil rights, uh, partly out of political viability earlier in his career. I'm sorry, but was he quiet during Gen um, Kennedy's administration have, about we're gonna, we're, civil rights? Uh, we're well, going to move on after this. I think he was relegated to uh, the vice presidential spot, so he didn't really have the spotlight where he could do a lot with civil rights. OK, thank you. Sure, sure. Thank you for waiting patiently. Uh, uh, apocryphal or not, I've always uh, enjoyed the story of LBJ calling on Bill Moyers for prayer at a prayer breakfast, and he wasn't speaking loudly enough, and he said, speak up, Bill, and Bill responded, I wasn't talking to you, Mr. President. <laughs> but, uh, it's a true but, story. <laughs> true story. But beyond that, uh, I mean, <laughs> Moyers, of course, has a very... Uh, deep spirituality and sophisticated social ethic, and I wonder what kind of influence or not that had on LBJ as far as policies were concerned. Hmm. Uh, it's hard to say. I think that, that, that the two had a very close relationship. I think uh, uh, Bill and uh, it was sort of like a surrogate son for LBJ. He had, he had a couple of them. Tom Johnson was another. Walter Jenkins, another aide, was sort of a part brother and part son to LBJ. So they had a very, very close relationship. And by, by Bill's telling, he's the prodigal son. You know, and he leaves the administration. I think there's some bitter, there was some bitterness between them. Uh, I don't know how the relationship ended. But I think he was uh, influenced by all his age. And I think that, to some degree, Bill uh, and the late Harry McPherson were consciouses of the, the Johnson administration. But I'm just interject here. Dick Goodwin was a former speechwriter I can't resist, but so talented, such an iconic part with the We Shall Overcome speech and the Great Society speech. What was, what was their relationship like and, and the contributions he made to the Well, I think that, that, that Goodwin was ultimately a Kennedy guy. You know, I think his loyalties lied with Jack Kennedy, but 
His great contribution to Lyndon Johnson, John, as you just pointed out, was the We Shall Overcome speech. And that's the, the, the speech that, that LBJ gives on March 15th, 1965, after the bloody events uh, in Selma, Alabama. You, you know, with the, the fire hoses and the police dogs and all those sorts of things. Uh, and that's, that's seen on national television by all of America. And we see really for the first time vividly how virulent racism is in the Deep South. And LBJ goes before Congress and he talks about all the obstacles that people of color in this country face as an everyday fact of life. And he invokes the phrase from the Negro spiritual that becomes the anthem in the civil rights movement. We shall overcome. He says very point, and we shall overcome. And John Lewis talks about seeing that speech with Martin Luther King. And it, it was the only time that Lewis saw Martin Luther King weep. And King looks at Lewis and says, we shall overcome. We will get this voting rights bill passed. And we shall overcome. Very pointed moment. So if Dick Goodwin did nothing else for Lyndon Johnson than pen that speech, he did more than enough. Yes, sir. Yeah, the, uh, the military management of the war obviously was a big failure. And uh, I've heard it mentioned that there was a three-legged stool there. There was Secretary of Defense McNamara, LBJ, and also the four-star general who, who was transferred out in, I guess you would say, disgrace. Uh, we had got up well over 500,000 troops. He was asking for a couple hundred thousand more, but he didn't. He claimed that McNamara told him to ask for that many more. What is your comment about this three-legged stool concept? And uh, was there, in fact, three people that were really running the show over there? Thank you. If there were three people, I think you missed the one that was probably most influential, and that's Dean Rusk. Who? Dean Rusk. Dean Rusk, who was President Kennedy's Secretary of State, and and remained on. I'm talking the military management now. No, I understand, but you yeah. mentioned McNamara, yeah. who was the Secretary of Defense. And I think the, mo the person who was most influential on Lyndon Johnson in terms of the operation of the war was Dean Rusk. I, I, I can't com com uh, comment on the, how the, the uh, war was run militarily. But ideologically, the reasons that we were there were most clearly uh, articulated to LBJ by by Dean Rusk, and Dean Rusk reinforced the notion that if you don't keep the communists at bay, we're gonna get World War III. And I think that was the guiding principle that kept Johnson in the fight in Vietnam, but I can't comment, unfortunately, about how the, uh, the war was run militarily. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah, there are several slightly contradictory or different uh, views that you've had here. One was of Johnson really resisting civil rights in the, uh, in, in the Senate. You then have him using Kennedy's legacy and inspiration to say, do this for our former president. And then there's also the sense of his being moved by these events. And you sort of have to ask to what extent was he interested in the civil rights? Would he have pushed it in the absence or was there part of Kennedy legacy that then then tipped him over in that direction, and obviously it's a complicated You're right, and dynamic. it does sound contradictory. You're absolutely right. Uh, let me just say that this man, when he was in the Senate, was from Texas. He was representing Texans. Texans were fundamentally opposed to civil rights at that time. Johnson, on the other hand, was an advocate for civil rights. Uh, from early on, his father uh, was an advocate for civil rights. He uh, he stood up against the Ku Klux Klan, risked his own life in order to do so when he was in the Texas legislature. Uh, this is a man who believed fundamentally that all men are created equal and was determined to see it through in this country. But while he advocated the Civil Rights Act of 1957 and the Civil Rights Act, Act of 1960, he also allowed them to be watered down in order to get them passed knowing full well that if they weren't watered down and toothless, they wouldn't be passed. So they were largely important only because of their symbolism. But when he had the, when he had the chance to do something uh, for civil rights, to push it through in 1964 when the time was right, 
His pushing it had little to do with Jack Kennedy, except using Jack Kennedy as a tactic to get it through. Using the martyrdom of John F. Kennedy, the fallen president, to get this through a reluctant Congress. That's what he did, he exploited it essentially. But I'm confident that given, uh, given Lyndon Johnson's heart, that he would have wanted civil rights regardless. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Good, thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, this is another question we, we got to Vietnam. I've been thinking about this for a while, and I keep thinking about all the tortured photographs I saw of LBJ regards to what to do, what not to do, and whatever. And I just was wondering whether, in fact, you glean from any of the tapes that he kind of felt boxed in, uh, meaning that I'm thinking about many of us went through the Cuban Missile Crisis, and that was very key as to how we perceived what, was, what could have happened. And we came so close to nuclear war. So what we saw is a president who said, I'm not going to allow the military to actually run yeah. over me, right? Based upon what happened at the Bay of Pigs. And I wonder if there was any influence on Lyndon Johnson, who was part of the National Security Council during that period of the Cuban Missile Crisis, that spilled over. But then the other part that I see, especially today, although it's kind of changed a bit, that the Joint Chiefs in particular and the field commanders always seem to have this one-upmanship going on against the civilian control of the military. So I was just wondering if you gleaned any of that in his thinking at all, because that's, I wondered that for a long, long time. Yeah, well, I think you hit on something. I think both uh, JFK and LBJ learned a lot through the Bay of Pigs and Cuban Missile Crisis experiences. And one was not to trust the, the military at face value, I mean, to, to question, to constantly question their recommendations. And one of the things that, that LBJ knows from the very beginning is that the military is going to ask for more and more and more troops. One of the things he says early on in 1964, again, uh, illustrating the, the paradox that he had with the war, is he says, no matter what I do over there, there will be killing. If I put troops in, there will be killing. If I don't do anything, there will be killing. And you just see he's wrestling with this. Yeah. And he doesn't know what to do about it. He really doesn't know what to do about it. That said, he does continue to escalate troop involvement. But I will tell you without question that his greatest disappointment upon leaving office is that he did not strike an honorable peace with Ho Chi Minh. And I think you think about the Johnson treatment. You know, you think about how effective he was one-on-one -on -one with somebody and how he could influence somebody so effectively. If he had gotten Ho Chi Minh in a room, it yeah. wouldn't have been interesting <laughs> yeah. to see what would have happened in that, in that conversation. And that's really what he wanted. And he was giving, and, and at one point, he offers these pork barrel promises to Ho Chi Minh. He says, if you pull out of, of, of South Vietnam, I'm going to create farms for you, not only in South Vietnam, but in North Vietnam. Now, how can you turn that down? Your people are going to benefit. We'll pour money into your country. And he couldn't believe that Ho Chi Minh would resist that. Because yeah. there's no congressman from Arkansas or from Montana <laughs> who would resist that. <laughs> you know, he'd bring money in. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you. Yes, sir. Just a comment <clears throat> first on your answer to the woman's question from the other microphone. You've got to remember, I'm sure you really know, <clears throat> that the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was based upon President Kennedy's Civil Rights of Act of 1963, which was promulgated uh, the night that Medgar Evers was assassinated in June of 1963. And I think thus it was an incomplete answer that you gave. <clears throat> and it's um, certainly there are problems with the 1957 Civil Rights Act, and that's why we needed eight years later the Civil Rights Act of 1965 but it's important to remember that that legislation created the Civil Rights Division in justice and created the Commission on Civil Rights with all of the great important reports it did. And um, so it may have been toothless, but it had a bite. Well, let me clarify one thing. I, 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 you're absolutely right. I, I 
didn't deny that, that the, there was a Civil Rights Act before uh, Johnson got involved with it. I, I was only saying that uh, he used Kennedy's death in order to persuade those reluctant to pass it to do so. Uh, but no, it was John F. Kennedy who proposed what became the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And what, what Johnson said uh, when he took over the reins of power, uh, after fashioning his statement, after uh, uh, Kennedy's famous statement, let us begin, is let us continue. He wanted to continue on the mm -hmm. legacy of Johnson. There's this great conversation between uh, uh, Martin Luther King and LBJ on the second full day of, of Johnson's uh, uh, tenure as president. He calls Martin Luther King, as he did business leaders and political leaders and civil rights leaders, he calls everybody. He does a remarkable job uh, in keeping the country stable in the aftermath of the assassination. And he says to uh, uh, Martin Luther King, I'm going to support them all. I'm going to support all those policies. And I want you to bring in your ideas. Come visit me. Next, next time you're in Washington, Martin, come see me. And let's talk about how we do these things right. He forms this coalition, this partnership. With, with Martin Luther King that's very effective. But one of the things that, that Johnson said, or King says to Johnson is that, you know, there's no better way that you can honor the late president than, than by pursuing his, his policies. He says, again, and Johnson says, I'm gonna, I'm gonna support them all. Thank you. Thank final, you. final question for you, yeah. Martin. Um, this book's about Johnson and the presidency, and it does present a, a remarkably multifaceted portrait of a man in full. What lessons, or what primary lesson do you think future presidents can take from Johnson's style of presidential leadership? Well, I think it's a bygone era in Washington. His Washington is, is long gone in Washington. But I think, again, I would, I would go back to civility. And one of the things that you hear is that Johnson is ruthless. I think that that's a misconception. I don't think Johnson's ruthless at all. Because Johnson was aware of how business was conducted in the halls of Congress. And that is through collegiality, compromise, and civility. He knew that. And he didn't vilify or demonize his opponents generally, because he knew that if they resisted him effectively on one thing, that he would have to work with them on another. He took the long view. And I, I think I was at a conference uh, a couple weeks ago in which Barbara Bush said that the compromise in Washington has become a dirty word. And, and that's, again, that's something I think that would, would disappoint Lyndon Johnson profoundly. And I think he would probably reach out to lawmakers, to ev anyone who had influence in Washington, uh, Grover Nordquist, Rush Limbaugh, all the lawmakers. Uh, all the liberals, Michael Moore, and he would grab them by the lapels, and he would say, "Come, let us reason together." Thank you all very Thank much. You very this much. Was, was very engaging. John, thanks so much. I've really enjoyed this. Yeah. Right. Thanks so much.